Folks, if you're just joining us, welcome. We'll give everyone a moment to get settled and sign in. You want to say hi in the chat? Let us know where you're tuning in from today. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to preview week for Willamette the Pinot Noir auction. The 2019 Willamette Valley wines featured in this tasting series are exclusive small lot bottlings for our wine trade auction. If you don't know about the auction and want to learn more about how to purchase these wines, contact Emily at the WVWA and I'll drop her address in the chat. I want to take a moment to thank all of our auction sponsors for their ongoing support. And a big special thank you to our imperial sponsor, Winebell. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers, <laughs> representing lot number 68, Wayne Bailey of Youngberg Hill. Representing lot 69, Erica Landon of Walter Scott. Representing lot 71, Jared Etzel of Domain Roy. Representing lot 72, Alfredo Apolloni of Apolloni Vineyards. Representing lot 73, Andre Mack of Maison Noir. And your host and moderator, Pat Dudley of Bethel Heights. Welcome, everybody. And thank you, Julia. Julia's had quite a week uh, organizing three each day. And there's still tomorrow ahead of us. So thank you, Julia, for that amazing work. And thank you, all people who are joining us today. We can't see you, but we know you're out there. And we appreciate your uh, coming along on this wonderful exploration of the Willamette Valley. We've got quite a nice cross-section today of the Willamette Valley. Um, we've got several different AVAs here. We have one from the Dundee Hills, two from Eola Amity Hills, one from the McMinnville District, and one from the brand new Tualatin Hills AVA. And so we'll have a chance to sort of see the Willamette Valley in lots of different pieces. And maybe at the end, we can come back and see what the Willamette Valley looks like as a whole from everybody's perspective. But we're gonna go right ahead and launch into these lots. I'd like to ask each winemaker in turn to tell us a little bit about where is your winery, when you started, and then anything real important about your situation and then describe your lot. We do have one 20 case lot today. So that's a real opportunity for somebody out there in the bidding public there are only three 20 k slots in the auction. So Andre has one of them and he'll tell us about that when we get to lot 73. But first, we'll go straight to lot 68, Wayne Bailey of Youngberg Hill. It's called Block One Old Vine Pomard Clone. Wayne, go for it. Thanks, Pat. Uh, welcome everybody. Glad to have you with us on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. Um, again, I am Wayne Bailey. I'm the owner and wine grower here at Youngberg Hill and Bailey Family Wines. Um, we are, uh, the vineyards are 32 years old here, and uh, our first label was in 96, so 25 years uh, of the Youngberg Hill label. Uh, we are in the McMinnville, we say Mac AVA, but it's McMinnville AVA, or sub AVA, nested AVA in uh, Willamette Valley. And uh, my particular bias uh, for the for the ABA is that we're uh, one of the furthest west and south, uh, so we get a lot of impact from the uh, Van Duzer and from the ocean currents and everything. So uh, I like the benefits of that. Um, we've been uh, organically farmed since uh, 2003, biodynamically farmed since 2011 started no-till farming in 2017 
and we are non-irrigated. So we're about as in sync with mother nature as we can possibly be. And uh, it has continued to show through in not only the quality of the grapes, but also the wines that we produce. Um, I will uh, say a little bit about 2019. I like 19 because uh, although it was a warm year, it was a cool, uh, long ripening season. It was about six weeks long and we harvested in mid-October. And that always gives us nice uh, balance in the wines. And that's what I like about the 2019. Um, it was uh, this particular blend uh, when we talk about the old vine Pomard is a predominantly Pomard clone, but there's a little bit of Aidensville in there and also Dijon 777. It is uh, the, the, the Pomard and the Aidensville vines are both 32 years old and they're on owned route. So uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of that complexity and depth, intensity, uh, Couple that with what you normally see in the Menville ABA fruit, you get a, a big bang for your buck. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of what the blend is all about. It's about 40% new oak. And when I talk about new oak, that doesn't mean all new barrels. It talks about once used barrels and twice used barrels and so on and what they contribute to it. So uh, that is uh, Youngberg Hill, lot number 68, right? Oh, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Cheers. I've been doing this all day, muting myself because <laughs> the tractor's going around the house, spraying the Maidensville block that I live in the middle of, and it makes so much noise. But I'll try to keep attached to the unmute button. Uh, we'll move right on, thank you, Wayne, uh, to Erica, my next door neighbor. Erica Landon of Walter Scott Winery, lot number 69. It's a 5K slot, so was Wayne. It's a 5K slot. And it's called The Sojourner. Erica, tell us all about it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, my name is Erica Landon. My husband and I, Ken, um, started Walter Scott in 2008. We are in the Eola Amity Hills on the Bethel Heights estate on their Justice Vineyard. We've been here now for 10 years. Can you imagine that, Pat? Uh, ten, our 10th harvest in this building. Um, we both Ken and I grew up in the Oregon wine industry and Ken really cut his teeth in the Eola Amity Hills working for St. Innocent and learning to make wine with Justice Vineyard and O'Connor Vineyard, which is now um, uh, right below the Zena Vineyard, which Andre is going to talk about and Temperance and all of these amazing sites. And for us, the Eola Amity Hills is really part of who we are and our history. We're pretty biased that way. Um, the, the ABA itself is just to the east of where Wayne is, um, almost a stone's throw, um, also quite far south and directly in line with the Van Duzer Corridor. So, you know, while the, the Willamette Valley as a whole is um, such classic Pinot Noir, beautiful, beautiful polish and um, classic red fruited and earth and spice. I think that the Eola Amity Hills has just a bit more of that like precision and tension that you find because of the cooler nights um, that we're very lucky to have, especially on days like this um, and those super rocky soils. So um, Sojourner is a vineyard that uh, was planted by the Peso family in um, about 16 years ago. They've been farming since the 70s in the ABA, and we've met them and started buying fruit from them really early on in the Walter Scott story. Uh, and they just became family. Uh, and we found out about their Sojourner Vineyard over time and started tenaciously bugging them, trying to get fruit because it was just a really special vineyard. Um, it is three different clones and we get a slice right down the center because my husband's a pain in the butt like that. Um, and he wants to pick all three clones the same day and co-ferment them. Uh, so it's also much like Wayne um, and his lot, it's primarily Pomard with Vadensville and um, Dijon 115, but they're all co-fermented from the beginning. Um, and this vineyard was originally called the Sojourner Vineyard. Um, and was that way for many years until it was uh, forced to rename. And that's a whole lot of sass and story I'm not gonna get into today, but it's now known as Sojo and just as sort of a little nod to its history and our love for the site, we named our auction lot 
uh, the Sojourner. It has actually been, it's a single barrel um, selection that we usually do from this site. It's been called Murder Mountain in the past. Um, but after 2020, we all needed something a little bit more lighthearted, I think. So we went with uh, Sojourner. And this year, it's actually two Chasson barrels, one new, one once fill, uh, blended 50-50 for the five cases. So that's it. I hope you like it. Pat, unmute. <laughs> I'm going to leave it unmuted and you can enjoy the sound of the tractor. How's that? That's fine. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I said thank you, Eric. <laughs> and, and we're going to move right along now to uh, from lot number 69, that was Erica, to 71, which is Jared. We're skipping number 70 because it's one of the Chardonnay lots that you would have heard of on Monday if you were with us on Monday. So now we have um, Jared Etzel, uh, lot number 71, another five case lot from Domain Roy, and it's called the Iron Filbert Grand Van. Tell us about it, please, Jared. Sure, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, my name is Jared Etzel. Um, the Etzel name you might recognize as I'm a second generation vintner. Um, and uh, my father, had uh, started Beaufrere Winery, which is over in uh, Ribbon Ridge. I grew up on that farm and uh, cut my teeth there a bit. And then uh, my dad jokes and says that I'm a <clears throat> trader now because I'm in the red dirt, you know, in his area, it's all uh, Willa Kenzie is sandy colored. So I'm the trader red dirt guy. And I started uh, Domain Roy with uh, Mark Roy um, in 2012, we bought the property. It's in Dundee Hills, uh, Morden Hill. Uh, it's a south facing, very warm vineyard um, that uh, we planted to an array of clones. But we're really lucky because it's an it's a absolutely spectacular vineyard. Um, very consistent and just has an energy on it. When you're, when you're at the site, you just, uh, you can feel the, the good energy. Um, we farmed it organically uh, from uh, the inception and uh, it is named Iron Filbert because uh, it's an homage to what it was prior to us owning it, which was a Filbert or hazelnut orchard um, and the iron portion of the name is coming from the iron rich soil um, of Jory, uh, which I find quite a bit in our wines. I find a very uh, sanguine, um, irony, oceanic profile um, that's very pure and, and is present, present in the wine, which I think is distinctive. Um, our auction lot, <clears throat> 2019 vintage, which I think is a spectacularly balanced vintage. It's uh, kind of a classic Oregon year where uh, the weather, not too hot, not too cold. There was, uh, we had a perfect ripeness of alcohol. Um, it's just below 13% um, with just this brightness to it across the board on the vintage. Um, this specific one uh, came from the center of our vineyard. It's a blend of Pomard and Vadensville. Um, we uh, fermented it in a, a concrete, a, a very large open top concrete tank, um, which I think also lends a, a touch of minerality and uh, kind of a, a nice fermentation kinetic. <clears throat> and uh, then we, aged this uh, barrel was uh, was in a neutral barrel uh, for about 10 months on the leaves. All the wines are unfined and unfiltered and uh, native ferments. Um, the thing that I notice about the wine, it just <clears throat> has the first thing, it has a spectacular luminous, luminous profile. So it's super purple uh, and vivid. Um, 
and uh, aromatically, uh, it's really appealing as it's that bright red fruit um, and uh, lavender iris. It's got a lot of purple tone to it. Um, the tannins are uh, super finesse driven, which I think is uh, common in, in Dundee. They, for me, they're lighter and round. Um, and just uh, a true expression of uh, Dundee Hills and, and uh, the best that we could do. And um, we're really happy with it. So uh, happy bidding. Thank you, Jared. Dundee Hills. Last time you called it Dundee-esque. So I think that's something we should talk about when we get round to the second round here. We've got next up, lot number 72, Alfredo Apolloni from Apolloni Vineyards. And it's a five case lot, King of the North. And we were looking for you to come with the big woolly hat on. <laughs> a little warm for the woolly hat right now, but. <laughs> Welcome, salute. Um, so honored to be here with these fantastic producers and this awesome cross section of. of hey, I'm Alfredo Apolloni with Apolloni Vineyards. Um, I grew up in a wine family in Northern Italy. Uh, and then we started from scratch here pursuing uh, the special Pinot Noir that Oregon is famous for uh, over 20 years ago, planting, planting vineyards up here in the far Northern reaches at the very, very top of the Willamette Valley. Uh, now uh, in our own new sub um, uh, ABA, the Tualatin Hills. So that was uh, new as of last year. We're very excited about it. Um, and we are one of the most Northern vineyards uh, in, in the, this nested ABA. We're just a stone's throw uh, away from the, uh, or the, the line of both the Willamette Valley and, and Tualatin Hills. Um, this beautiful place, we're, we're in the rolling foothills of the coastals, uh, close to some of the highest ridges in the coastal mountains. They're, they're important for our, for our temperate weather, particularly around harvest, um, something that, that uh, affects us every year. But in 19, uh, we were in a little bit of the rain shadow from those coastals and, and that kept things a bit drier up here um, as well as cooler um, and allowed us to hang on there as, as into, into mid-October. Uh, mid um, the wine we brought you today, the King of the North, I dressed it up for you in its robes. Um, we're, we got to be a little fun up here, up in the far northern reaches, um, is uh, is from our second planting. This is probably the coolest spot on our on our vineyard. Uh, it is at about 600 feet of elevation um, and uh, east facing, so we're we're getting morning sun and in the in the shade uh, for the afternoons. That helps really preserve the floral aromatics and the lively uh, fruit. Um, we're, we're uh, most, most of the Dwalton Hills AVA here is in Laurelwood family soils. So, so low soils, uh, those, those uh, make wonderful expressive Pinot Noirs with lots of fruit, but some, some, some nice, uh, some of those nice earth and spice qualities folks have touched on. Um, and in this particular bottling, this is one barrel um, so we went through the whole barrel cave, a tough job, and picked the barrel that we thought was most representative. Um, and it is almost all Vadensville. It's from this very, very tiny spot at the top of that uh, Olivia Vineyard. Um, so a classic clone that's been in Oregon for a long time. Uh, also brings some, some spice to the fruit uh, quality. And hope you enjoy the King of the North. Salute. Cheers. Great. Thank you very much. I keep hearing Vadensville. It's so interesting. It really is one of the heritage clones, but uh, not widely planted a while ago. We, I've been surprised to see it springing up again. It's like it's having a renaissance. Maybe it's the climate. Anyway, moving right along. Andre is coming to us from New York today where it's raining and cooler yeah. than where we are, where it's 99 degrees apparently. Um, this is the 20 K slot, by the way. So, some people should be looking out for this great opportunity to get more than just five cases from this auction. Um, Andre has lot number 73, Lamb of God. Please tell us all about it. Yes, yes. Uh, 20 case lot. I think I've done 20 case lot every single year. And I'm always like rah, rah, rah about it. And so I, like, I have to sign the labels. So I spend hours signing the labels, my hand is cramped. And I'm like, <laughs> 
everybody, all you guys have it figured out. Like I'm the like hard headed one where it's like, dude, I might keep doing this thing. Um, you know, I, um, I got into wine by watching old episodes of Frasier. You know, I worked as a waiter. Oh. Uh, I was inspired, you know, as working as a waiter, you know, I've, that's my background as a restaurant. So I so saw my for, um, for many years, I worked for Thomas Keller at the French Laundry and at Rosé. And, um, you know, was really inspired by the wines that, um, that were coming out of the, the region and out of the Willamette Valley. And it was just like this thing of like wanting to be there, wanting to be a part of it. Um, and in 2007, you know, I made my way to, uh, to the Willamette Valley. Um, I was introduced to ELO and the Hills um, through working at, you know, at Seven Springs Vineyard. And, um, you know, it's kind of really kind of fell in love with the place and, and really wanted to, to actually make something and, you know, make that leap from restaurant to, um, to, to producing wine. And so, um, and now that I think about it, I've been doing it for 13 years. So longer than I ever been a sommelier. But anyways, uh, I'm always super excited to be a part of this. This, the, the auction is great. Um, it's been, it's been wonderful. We've done the 20 case lot every single year. Um, uh, and so this year our offering is called Lamb of God. I mean, I think every year it's called Lamb of God. Um, and due to a sticky situation, uh, my company used to be called Mouton Noir Wines and, uh, you know, uh, another Mouton, you know, we were in a legal battle for about six or seven years. Uh, mm -hmm. Hence we changed the name to Mouton Noir Wines. But uh, 2019 Lamb of God is uh, one single barrel, uh, brand new barrel, Francois Ferreira. Um, uh, from Zena Crown, which is located in the Yolamity Hills. Um, uh, it's been in the barrel for about 15 months. Um, and then it, before it was wrapped, and Zena Crown, I've always been in love with. I was sad when it got sold, but then we were still allowed to buy fruit. So that was great. Um, and that's it. I, I think, you know, 20 cases was always, uh, you know, it was closer to a barrel to me, like 22 to 25. So I always felt like let's offer a whole barrel. So there you have it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I'm sure it was sweet. There we go. That's, um, yeah. So <laughs> Eola Amity Hills, uh, that's of course where I'm from too. I, I think, thank you all for being pretty concise about your presentation because we have a nice amount of time here for some questions. And I think first thing we should do is find out, do you all have questions or comments for each other um, that we would start with? And if not, well, I've got a few and Julia's got a few. And maybe we've got some audience members with questions. But first of all, all of you, any comments to each other? Any uh, questions to each other before we go? I have a question um, for Jared. Uh, Jared, are all of your Pinot Noirs fermented in cement uh, fermenters? Is that what you guys primarily do or do you just have one or two that you play with? I wish uh, they were all uh, cement. Um, <clears throat> I'm not at that luxury yet, but I'm pinching my pennies and you know, that's my dream. Uh, I, well, not only cement, I would love to have cement and wood and amphora and a little stainless. Maybe the best is insulated stainless, I think. I, I like it just because it changes hemp a little slower. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have these tanks, uh, the cement, they're Nico Velo, and I saw them, I was touring Cheval Blanc and their new winery, they got the beautiful tulip uh, from Nico Velo and so, I uh, rallied the troops and we got two of them. And wow. yeah, it's fun, really. Jealous. Yeah. Are there but it doesn't make the wine, you know, the grapes are what make the wine what it is. The, everything else, it's, uh, you know, it might help a little bit. It's fun to play with, but the, the grapes are the mm. Agreed. Cool. A, a couple of you, uh, well, all of you, I think this is across the board, have really talked about your AVA uh, as a significant part of your story, that this has got unique qualities. It's not like any place else in the Valley. 
Um, and we've got more and more of them coming on. We've got the brand new Tualatin Hills, which is very far north, as we heard. And we've got, I think, three more in the pipeline, possibly more than that. So there's been this dividing going up in the Willamette Valley ever since the first six were approved, uh, nested ABAs in 2006. And, I'm in, and since this is the auction to support the Willamette Valley, which is the big appellation that encompasses all of us, and we did just receive the protected geographical indication status from the EU, and the auction is to support the Willamette Valley, we I'd like to hear you talk about given all of the subdivisions into the different AVAs. If somebody said to you, but what is the Willamette Valley like different from all other New World Pinot Noir regions? Uh, what would you say to that? It, is it all about your sub AVA or is there a common characteristic that you could or set of characteristics that you could possibly describe to a an outsider looking in for the first time. Who wants to bite on that one first? I guess I'll go. Can I go? Good. Thank you. Go for it. Oh, is that yes? Okay. Yes, me? Andre. I can go. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yes, Andre. Yeah, I'm great. I'm you know, I, think, I think for me, the, the, the way I've, I've always explained it and, and what was like clear to me, like as I started to get into wine and taste for Atlanta Valley Pinot, which to me, it encompasses kind of the best of both worlds, right? It does have that fruit that you associate with California meets that terroir, taste of the land of the old world. Um, and that's what always kind of drew me to it. You know, some people was like, oh, it's burgundy with training wheels. You know, and I always felt like not necessarily, it's its own thing. Um, and, and for me, that's what I was always do. It's kind of like in between. Um, and then as an overarching thing, and then as you start to break down the sub AVAs, you get a little bit more specific and, and, and kind of, you know, granular, which is like a really interesting exercise as well. Good. Who else would like to bite on that one? Hey, wait. Okay. No. Okay. And I, I just add what Andre uh, said in that, as I think I mentioned the other day, is that that happy medium, that, that Goldilocks, if you will, is that people are very familiar with Burgundy, I think, and, and the earthy characteristics. And be just because of volume, people are very familiar with California Pinot Noirs too, which tend to be much more forward leading, uh, fruit forward leading. And uh, I think we're the happy medium where we get we get a balance of both, not overly too much. Of course, we get a lot of nice variability with our seasonality as well, being in the cooler climate. Um, what I like to your point about the, the different nested ABAs is uh, the similarity to what you do experience when you're Burgundy. If you're, you know, if you're in uh, Bone, you're talking about the, the, the different vintage uh, wineries and the characteristics and everything there. If you're in uh, Givry Chauvetan, you get very different characteristics and uniquenesses. And then you go up to Dijon. So they're all very different and unique in their own way. And I think that's what you see here in the Willamette Valley, which is really, which is really great. Does everybody agree that there actually is something you, if you were to have a lineup, could you pretty much count on being able to tell the difference between Willamette Valley? Oh, Eric is going to tell us something. Speak. Well, I mean, I, I don't need to interrupt your question. I can. Oh, no. It's the same question. I think, I think, yeah, I mean, um, I think Willamette Valley does stand out uh, on its own and its own two legs and has its own unique characters, characteristics based on what these two gentlemen have so eloquently said. I wanted to just say though that when I think about the Willamette Valley beyond the you know incredibly unique fruit characteristics and the terroir and, and all of the climactic influences that we have that are very unique to the Willamette Valley, I think much more about the community of the Willamette Valley and the industry and how it really, when you think of, you know, yes, we have these incredibly beautiful, unique sub AVAs that are coming out. And I think that that's really special because what Pinot Noir is and, and has been historically is about specific site and place and, and farming and uh, the, the intricacies of one special block. Um, but this valley is so much more than that. And it has so much more to do with the people in it. 
and we were talking about it last night um, on a Instagram. And you know what it really comes down to me is I think about everyone who built this industry. And from the very, very beginning, there was a camaraderie that has translated from generation to generation from the standard bearers and the pioneers and the founders, whatever you want to call them, all the way through the newest fanciest winery that you know is popping up and everyone's invited to the room everyone's voice counts and we're all willing to open our books and and share knowledge and share experiences and share techniques because you know because we all believe in the valley itself and so while maybe that isn't exactly what you're looking for from my answer it's very important to us and um i think it's why so many of us are here and uh, and also, I do want to say, while it's a, it's a huge, huge honor to be recognized by the EU, um, I think it really just solidifies what a lot of us believe, which is that Willamette Valley can stand on its own two feet on the world stage. It can be picked out in a blind tasting of Pinot Noir. And we all believe that for a long time. So it's great to get that recognition, but damn it, we're here. So. Indeed. Uh, I'm going to add... Uh, I'm going to add to what Eric just said and uh, and just use my own experience. I uh, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and I remember growing up, and we were all growing corn and raising pigs, right? And we didn't look at each other as competitors. We looked at each other as neighbors, and neighbors help each other out. If you need help harvesting, you help. If you need help shelling corn, whatever it might be. We work together. And when I first came out here, uh, one of my uh, first uh, introductions was to, uh, was to Jimmy Brooks. And uh, we became great friends and things. And, and he introduced me to a lot of other people, uh, Michael Etzel being one of them. And, uh, and it was great because uh, what I experienced in the valley from the get-go was what I lived with in, in Iowa, which was we're all growing wine grapes, we're all making wine, but we didn't see each other as competitors at all. You never did see competitive spirit, if you will. It was, we're all neighbors. We're all in this together. We all need to do whatever we can to help each other be the, all the best that we can be. And I think that has what really has lifted and made the Willamette Valley what it is. Good, certainly true. Uh, okay, I'm gonna change the subject unless somebody else has something they wanna say about that. But I've had another question on my mind um, throughout these panels that I've had the great pleasure of, of actually being able to participate in. Um, people have talked about the 2019 vintage. Of course, all the wines in the auction this year are 2019. And so far on this panel, we haven't said much about that vintage, but um, it's been an interesting comparison because with the last year we had an auction, which wasn't last year, but we did. It was uh, the 2018 vintage that probably a lot of the people that are participating in preview week will have been familiar with because we did it last year very different vintages. I've heard a number of winemakers today talk about how much they love 2019 for all kinds of reasons, um, but I would like to, and compared to 2018, they love them both, but they're so different. So I would love to hear all of you, your take on 2019, how it's showing now while it's very young, maybe just been bottled, how it's gonna age, how it's gonna compare to 2018, and anything else you'd like to say about 2019, which seemed an anomaly to some of us. So who would like to grab that one first? How about Jared? You didn't talk about the other question. Tell us. Yeah, um, I, for us, it was, it was a, a really a year of balance. Um, and our site, uh, because it's, 300 feet base to 500 feet, and it's a southeast slope. We always have enough warmth um, to ripen every vintage, even in uh, really cool vintages. So for us, it's about trying to find the window where 
we don't have too much ripeness. Uh, and, you know, of course, we don't pick too early and have under ripeness, but we, uh, were, we were able to have a pretty leisurely pick um, starting in the first week of September. <clears throat> and um, we got beautiful alcohol levels, which I like when, I, when they're below 13 or in that range because uh, everything is allowed to be in such good balance and uh, bright acidity. Um, and uh, they're not overly dark, you know, um, which I think allows some of the delicacy of the varietal to come through. And um, I just think it's, for us, it was a very Dundee wine and, um, and a very, uh, a wine that I could identify, um, I believe, blind as a, uh, Dundee and, and possibly even from our, our place. And, and so I was super happy. Cool, good. And so what about you? Um, so I'm looking at Alfredo, you can't tell that, but I am. Because hey. you were very far north in 2019. How did that go for you? And how did you like that compared to 2018? Um, I, I, I would echo a lot of what Jared had to say. I, I think that uh, we were a little worried with some showers coming through, that's always a concern, um, especially close to harvest. Um, because our sites are, are later, I mean, in general, I would say 10 days to 14 days later than sites in, in Dundee or the, that, that warmer area. Um, and we didn't get quite as much rain as we were expecting. That was, that was a, a real positive for us. Um, and, and I think the hang time uh, made for these elegant wines that he was talking about that have the liveliness, alcohols below 13, um, really, I think some characteristics that are, are pretty classic for Oregon. I mean, we talked about Willamette Valley. Willamette Valley are wines with energy, wines with, with lively acid that pair well with food. Um, and and that's, that's the character that really showed through in this vintage. So we're super excited about it. Uh, uh, and yeah, good vintage. Good. Erica, how about you? What about 2019? You know, for, for us, I think that um, 2019 was really marked by the yields. Um, we were much, much lower yields down with the sites that we work with. Um, I don't know if that was across the valley, but certainly with a lot of the, um, the Yola Amity sites that we were working with, we were down almost 40% in yield year over year from 18. And I feel like 18 was down from 17. And 18 was like, was a perfect, perfect vintage in so many ways. And, um, and so when we went into 19 and the yields were lower, um, uh, you know, it was one of those things where you just, you know, you're going okay. But I think it helped because it helped with getting this, for the wines that we made, I feel like we have this beautiful concentration and density to the Chardonnays and to the Pinot Noir that we made. But balanced with really, really like the, to echo what these guys are saying, really well balanced uh, acid and um, alcohol. So, you know, having mid 13s on the reds and, you know, under 13 for the whites, but still having power and this weight to them and concentration, which I think ultimately we love. Um, I think it's a great vintage. Um, and I think that they're very cellar worthy. You know, there are wines that can that can hold up to time because their structure is there from beautiful acids and low pHs all the way through to the flavor profile. So we we are huge fans of the vintage. Um, and I think also anytime you have a vintage that, you know, with a little bit of rain at harvest or whatever challenge might come through, whatever you're, it makes it more intense and, and more, uh, exciting to see what comes out the other end. Uh, that sounded really bad. Excuse me. But yeah, so it's exciting. And I, you know, I think that there's going to going to be absolutely stunning wines from 19 from across the valley. And I think you're looking at some of them right here today. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia, do you have questions from the audience for these folks? This is such an interesting group. I would love to get your take on something that I, I think about a lot. And that is um, when you talk about your site with regard to the soil specifically, how do you think that, like, what is the number one way that that actually translates into your wine? Like the, thinking about your auction wine, like where do you see 
the soil aspect of your site in that wine. Okay, that's a tricky one. Well, for for us, um, you know, we've got our old vines, the the Pomard and the Baynesville vines, on two entirely different soils. One is on volcanic rock, uplifted rock, and the other is on marine sediment. And um, I think both of those show through in this, and that's why I picked the barrels that I did because they showed a really nice balance of pomard fruit coming from those two different soil types. And, um, you know, being at, at seven, 800 feet also makes a difference as well in terms of those two blocks um, that, that come through. So I would, I would say for the 2019 vintage, and I think this is why we talked about Badensville a lot, is that the, uh, the, the volcanic rock soil, which tends to accentuate the Vainsville clone a little bit more, really shows through in 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 these wines, and in fact, in particular, our wine. So, we had an interesting comment from the last panel about soils, um, diversity of soils in, in as the, as a part of the the biodiversity in the wine. Because a lot of sites don't have a single soil. A lot of sites have all kinds of mixed up soils so that each one becomes an expression of its own. And it's it's easy to just say, oh, it's story here in the Kaya there, but it's never just one thing. So do, do any of you have some of these sites that have um, more than one soil in the same block that you put into a wine? You no. Know? It's been, it's, it's been sort of an interesting question about whether people really know what's in their soil. Not it has actually been explored to, to say for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this Vainsville clone renaissance, by the way. Are there, let's see, every, I don't know, Andre, what is planted at the Zena Crown? It is, is it Vainsville? You're muted. You're on no, mute. No, yeah, I got it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, this is from Block 11. It's uh, 115. But all the other four, I believe, had talked about Gainesville clone. And yeah. if I got that right. And I would love to hear, because we have had that in our vineyard since 1977. It was always a late ripener. And so you got to have more pomard to make sure you get to the end. But now it seems to be catching on again as a, as a good option. And I'd be interested to hear those of you, like Jared, you have all Badensville on this iron filbert. Is that right? Did I hear that right? Yeah, from Arden, Badensville. From Arden, Badensville. Yep. And what do you find the Badensville brings to it in, in particular? Well, the, the, what, from my site, the clusters are uh, quite big and the berries are quite large. So um, it ripens slower and we get uh, bright, uh, high tone acidity, which is which is really nice. A freshness, a lively acid, um, light red fruit profile. But I think it's the big cluster that slows down the ripening for a warm site. It's a nice pairing and um, and just works. And then on the opposite extreme, we have Alfredo and the coolest site having Vadensville. How does that do there? Well, it's, it's definitely one of the last things that's getting ripe. And, uh, and, and I do think that adds to some of this sort of classic Oregon style. It's, it's getting warmer and, and, uh, and we're, we're picking earlier. I mean, sometimes we're picking into September, even up here. Uh, and so we are looking to some classic clones that maybe ripen a little later, some sites that are a little higher up. Um, but back to your soil question, because I think that's super cool. Uh, we do, you know, most of the eastern facing slopes here uh, in the Tualatin Hills and, and, and Lowerwood are, are low Lowerwood soils that were, were blown in. But the west facing slopes are, are often uh, volcanic jewelry soils or something of that family. And, and I think that's the super cool part about Pinot Noir. It is so expressive of soil in place. And these sites for us are, you know, 100 yards apart. And the wines always taste different, even if the clone is exactly the same. So... So cool. I mean, you know, and, and one of the things that's so fun about this auction is you can taste through these wines and you'll, you'll find uh, all the nuance and then get a big picture of, of, the, of the wonderful value we're in. 
Um, I have a question. So the three of you that have Vadensville, they're all pretty old vines, right? They're some of the original plantings. Not you, Jared. Mine are only nine, nine years old. So did you get cuttings from from uh, the Beaufort estate like your dad did for Sequitur? Uh, I wish I would have for this planting. Um, no, mine were uh, from from a nursery on that planting. On some of my uh, newer vineyards that I planted, um, I did get cuttings from uh, my dad, which were from uh, Bill Wayne, you know, Abbey Ridge, which were some of the oldest planted stuff. But no, mine here were. Uh, nursery. But Alfredo and Alfredo are yours really old? Well, ours are only 20 years old. So I wouldn't say wow. really old. <laughs> you know, all things are relative. Mean, we've got relative. what you're talking about 30 years. We're we're getting into the the, the exciting parts of, of the early uh, plantings. I'm gonna I for us, uh we're huge fans of multi-clone plantings and really like those old heritage clones like Pomard and Vadensville. And I think Pomard and Vadensville for me over the years when I was a wine buyer and, and now I love how they play together and a touch of Dijon is great. But to what Dave McIntyre saying in the, um, in the chat, I think, you know, going with older clones, more clonal diversity, um, also, you know, looking at rootstock, that's going to get, that's going to help us get through severe, severe vintages and, you know, these clones that when we're having warmer and warmer vintages, I mean, we're probably going to start picking in August in some of the sites in the valley, well, maybe one of the earliest vintages on record. And so we went to this place where we were a lot of the earlier ripening clones were planted and now we're warmer and those older clones are really, um, they're doing really well in these warm vintages. So that's, that's where we lean towards vineyards that have Vadensville and Pomard and, and also more colonial diversity because that's what we're looking for. One of the things I heard on a couple of the other panels quite frequently mentioned was Masal selections. Some of, the, some of the winemakers are starting to plant, you know, a diversity of clones with a single buck and other with rootstocks. And I'd be interested to hear if anybody here has been also doing that. Yes. Like just mix them up. Yep. yep. With my new, um, I have a new vineyard uh, that I planted in 17. And I have seven clones of Pinot Noir completely mixed up. And then I have a separate block of Chardonnay with six clones of Chardonnay completely mixed up. And the idea for me was that <clears throat> um, because uh, even within a small piece of land, you have variability in different profiles in that small piece of land soil. Uh, if you have one clone planted through that block, then you only get that one expression. Um, but if you have all those clones mixed in that same piece of land and you get a uh, kaleidoscope of expression, and then it's going to be co-fermented. And um, so it's really taking maybe a bit of control away, but uh, trading it for more of a, uh, a natural East uh, expression. Cool. And um, I think I like it, time will tell. <laughs> I will tell. Anybody else planting Masal selections anywhere? We don't own any land, um, but we do work with, I think, some amazing growers um, in this valley. And we definitely have a handful of growers who are planting um, clonal mixes. And they're very exciting to work with. Um, we're huge, huge fans. Um, we try at least a minimum of three clones, but there are, like, Ex Novo has 20 clones of Chardonnay and 10 clones of Pinot Noir in their two blocks. Um, and we're seeing more of that. You know, we started working with Laurent and um, Robert on a on a block at Lubajac that's got a bunch of different clones mixed together for the Chardonnay. And I just think there's it's it's to what to what Jared just said. You know, for us, it's like one instrument playing a song or an orchestra playing a song, and all of it translating and harmoni harmonizing the site together. For us, it just creates this incredible. Um, 
complexity in the wines that we love. And, you know, you have some that are more ripe, some that are less ripe, some that are perfect. And so you have more acid, but more ripeness and density and it just comes together in this really amazing way. So we're all about it. Less control. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Uh, Julia, any more questions popping up? I thought I saw somebody here. There's a, there's a lot of banter in the chat. I haven't seen any any questions, folks. If okay. You have any, do you have any more? The time. I, I, I do have one, and that is, um, you know, there's such a, diff, a great breadth of experience in this group, and I'm wondering uh, if you look back to your, your first harvest, your first year as a winemaker um, to now, what do you think is the biggest thing that's changed or that you've learned about about your wine making, the way that you approach wine, what do you think is the biggest way that you've grown since that time? Well, who hasn't, how about Andre, you start. I was thinking about Andre for this one. Yeah, I could take this one. You know, um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is like, you know, global warming is a, is a real thing. You know, we were picking late October uh, back in like uh, 2007. So it's definitely different and like just understanding the stress like and then like 14 15 came along where you know we're all wearing shorts and you're, you're picking a lot earlier um and also i i think the biggest thing that i learned is that i wasn't as good as i thought i was at the beginning right where, where it's just like like and then your and then and then your style changed you know you're like like oh like i thought these ones were like i was like doing something and then you taste them you're like wow like my friends were just really nice to me. But like <laughs> overall, I think like, you know, taste taste change with over the years, we started to pick a lot earlier. Um, and I think just consumerism tastes have changed over the year. Um, as a fact now, you know, people are drinking vinegar, right? You know, like in the, in the sense of like, you know, just drinking vinegar, kombucha is a big thing. And, and so the tastes have changed where we're, you know, I was thinking like some underripe vintages like 07 for, um, for Oregon where, when you were showing them, people were like, ah, I don't know, but like now people embrace them. So. Yeah, interesting how it is. Other people, your change, how have you changed since you started? What have you learned since you started? Patience. <laughs> A lot of patience and everything uh, from growing in the winery, um, letting it, wine grapes are a uh, beautiful, beautiful agricultural product and making a beautiful product that we're able to enjoy. And most of the time, uh, nature does a really good job working it all out and, you know, back to the mixed clone thing. Uh, I think the, the more, the more clones, the, the, the merrier and uh, letting go of that control and thinking we got to control it and make it happen. It does it beautifully. And uh, just having the patience and waiting it out and letting it do its thing has been my biggest growth. Good. It's interesting how it, one of the things we always talk about the Willamette Valley that makes it exciting and fun is the vintage variations. I mean, it drives you nuts for sure. And stress is terrible. But it is the most exciting thing about it. It's always different every year. And here we are again. And this is going to be interesting. <laughs> uh, we had bloom during a heat dome we've never had before. How is your crop looking this year, by the way, everybody? Pretty good? Variable. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of variability. Mm -hmm. And uh, relatively light uh, again uh, this year for us. Um, so that's a couple of years in a row of light, uh, light yield, some potentially great wines. Um, I, I, I like the, the words of wisdom from Wayne. You know, I think at the beginning, you want to control everything. And then you stand you listen to folks and say, oh, you know, uh, maybe we'll just wait, even though it looks like it might rain a little bit here in 2019. And sure enough, it dried out and it was fantastic. Uh, yeah. uh, but at the moment, you're biting your nails and you're full of energy and worried. <laughs> Yes. Anxiety is an essential ingredient. <laughs> In the wine. <laughs> 18,000 weather apps. Well, it's um, been really, if anybody has any other general comments or you want to ask any more questions, if not, I'll say we've had a really good time. 
and we're going to have a really great auction 2019 vintage um everybody should step up and bid frequently bid, bid high and get some good willamette valley wines from this really fine vintage we just had in spite of all the anxiety and thanks everybody for joining us and thank you to all of the bidders on the show we'll look forward to seeing you again thanks julia too Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Thank you Pat. Thanks, Thank Pat. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.